Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us again for another program brought to you by the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society. Uh, I am Bree Pappen. I am the Museum Services Coordinator here at the Rawlings Branch of the Pueblo City County Library District. And I have the pleasure of being joined by Peg Rooney, who is the president of the AVAS. And our special guest tonight is Mark Yeager. Thank you so much for joining me, both of you. I really appreciate you being here. Um, and tonight's program, uh, something that I personally really love, it's a review of Colorado butterflies. And Mark Yeager will be presenting um, a review of Colorado butterflies. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about Mark before we get started, and then I'll turn it over to you, Peggy. Uh, Mark Yeager, Yeager is also known as the artist Radu. I'm sorry, did I pronounce that correctly? Close enough. Radeau? <laughs> Radeau. Radeau, okay. Uh, he has illustrated a number of scientific publications and produced his own art from his gallery and studio on Union Avenue here in Pueblo for many years. The paintings incorporated life-size birds, animals, and insects, including butterflies. He has been a past president and treasurer of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society many times over. He's been a birder for 50 plus years and a butterflyer since the mid 90s. He's still leaning, learning about birds and insects as he goes along. So I'm really excited to have you present your, um, your talk on butterflies, uh, Colorado butterflies. So I will turn it over to you and uh, Peg. Okay. All right. Oh. Well, welcome. I want to welcome you all here tonight and I remind you that our pollinators are in trouble. And pollinators are bees, bats, butterflies, uh, beetles, and others. And they're in trouble because of the increased use of pesticides, habitat destruction, and climate change. So Arkansas Valley Audubon has been trying to um, work on this problem by planting native plant gardens for pollinators. And our most recent native plant garden is on the Pueblo Community College campus. So if you get a chance, you might want to drive or walk down Ormond Avenue and you'll see two beautiful garden sites that the PCC STEM club students and their instructors planted just recently. And if you'd like to join us, to support us in our efforts to protect our pollinators, you can do so by joining the Audubon Society or by making a contribution. And there's information on both of those things on our website, Southern Colorado Birds, abbreviated S-O-C-O, -O, so socobirds.org. Join us, help us. And I'll turn things over to Mark. Thanks, Peg. Mm -hmm. So first I'm going to, uh, if you want to get into looking at butterflies, I'm going to show you two of the field guides that I recommend uh, to learn about butterflies. And this first one is called Butterflies Through Binoculars, the West. And it's got beautiful photos and range maps of the butterflies. The thing about that one is it's the West. So if you want to go to the East, you're going to have to get another field guide to the East. Now the other one I use that's a good pocket one, and this is, has all the butterflies of North America it's the Kaufman Guide to the Butterflies, and it's got computer-enhanced photos and uh, the range maps. And the thing about range maps with butterflies that's kind of different with birds is they usually stick to that range. They don't they don't go all over the country like some some rare birds do. So so when you are trying to identify a butterfly that might look like another butterfly, you can look at the range map, and if it's not in Colorado, then it's not that butterfly. There are some tropical migrants, and we'll talk about those a little bit too, that migrate a little bit, but, but mostly they stick to their range, and that's partly because they have host plants that, that are native plants. So like Peg says, native plants are very important. And each of these field guides will tell you which host plant is good for that butterfly. So um, now we're, we're gonna get into the, the, the other thing besides a good field guide, is you want close focus binoculars or, or a camera. Sometimes a cell phone camera will work for, for identifying butterflies. You know, the way butterflies used to be identified was using a net. And you can see by this slide that there are people with nets and we, we, we mostly let the kids use nets when we do these butterfly counts. 
And, and this group of, of butterflyers, this is at Sugar Rite State Park in New Mexico, and we're all looking at mud. And mud is one of the things that attracts butterflies. The other thing that attracts butterflies besides native plants are, are rotten fruit, and uh, sometimes uh, poop will attract butterflies. They, they get the minerals out of them. So if you find uh, some scat in the forest, you might find butterflies. And, and some, some like to be on hilltops. So if you get on a ridge with a hilltop, you'll find different butterflies that way. So the, these people, and I've been butterflying down in, in the Colorado border south of Trinidad at the Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area and Sugar Rite State Park. We do, a, we do an annual, it's the, called the Bodicious Butterfly Festival. And this year it's, it's June 18th and 19th. And the guy I learned most about butterflies from, Steve Carey, he, he was the New Mexico State Parks naturalist. He, he conducts the, the field trips on, on uh, the Saturday, and he made me start conducting them on Sunday. I used to follow him everywhere, but now I have to lead my own field trip. So, um, Okay, we'll go to the first slide here. Breeze there. We'll go next. Oops, I'm waiting for... Okay, this is this is the the, the most the, the addition to my program that, that that I didn't do the last time, and and I've added this butterfly. It's shown up in my yard a few times. Mostly you find them in Arizona and places, but I've seen them in Pueblo several times in my garden, and I, I just like this butterfly because of his name. It's it's called the American Snout, and as you can see by his proboscis there, he's he's got a big nose, and that's how you would identify that butterfly. We'll go next. Next. Okay, I hope we can get the next slide up here pretty soon. Now, another thing about identifying butterflies, uh, a lot of times when they're wide open, you can't tell the difference between what they are. You like to wait until they have their wings folded up like the snout does, but, but it's his nose that gives it away. I'm not sure if Bree can hear me because we're out of... Okay, I want to get to the next slide here soon, so... I'm going to go ahead and, and start a fresh slide. Just one moment. Okay. Okay, so I have that next slide up for you. Is that correct? Okay, yeah, it's, it's small. It shows two other slides, but um, this is the uh, Colorado State butterfly. It's the Colorado hair streak, and, and we'll get more into talking about it next, and, and we'll go to the next slide first. But, but there is a Colorado State insect. Now, most of these um, butterflies are going to follow the order they are in the book, and, and the book starts with the swallowtails, and they're kind of the most spectacular and largest of the butterflies in southern Colorado. This is the western swallowtail, western tiger swallowtail, and the next slide shows another view of it. Now you'll notice that on the bottom of this, and that's the thing, butterflies have a short lifespan, so, so they'll wear out their wings, and, and uh, the, the western tiger swallowtail is real similar to the next one I'll show you, but but the next one's called a two-tailed swallowtail, and you look for the two tails, but this one's all chewed up, so you couldn't tell. So you really want to look at the stripes on this one. There are wider tiger stripes than on the, on the two-tailed swallowtail. We'll go that, that next. 
and, and go to the next one too. No, nope, back one. Well, anyway, the two-tailed swallowtail has really narrow stripes on it, so you can sometimes tell it just, just in the air. And this, this swallowtail is the black swallowtail, and it's pretty easy to identify. And I'll probably use some economics to describe sizes of these. So these, these, these butterflies are, are as big as a dollar bill and sometimes even bigger. And we'll go to the next one, which is another black swallowtail. And this is, this is the black swallowtail with its wings open. And this is on a bee balm, a native plant. Next. And this one is called the pipe vine swallowtail. It's got beautiful blue iridescence. And, and we'll go to the next one that shows the pipe vine closed up. And it's got a real distinct, a real distinct pattern on, the, on its underwing with those eye spots and everything. Now we're going to the next category of butterflies. Those are some of the swallowtails around here. And this, this one is, is the most common white butterfly you'll see around Pueblo. It's the cabbage white. It's, it's a European immigrant, so you find it on a lot of uh, non-native plants, especially your dandelions in your yard. But it is the most common. And it's a white, and it just has very few spots. And you'll see the underwing is, has a yellowish cast to it. Go to the next one. And this, this is a bunch of uh, cabbage whites on, on those dandelions. And, and these, these will occur in your yard quite often. Now the next one. There's another white, and that's this is the checkered white, and it's it's a native white, and it has a checkered pattern on it, and it's it's probably the second most common white that you'll find around here. Now the next one. Okay, this is this is one that I usually see at the tops of the pine trees. It's called the pine white, and you can see that distinct veining in its lower wing, and, and the, the beautiful red edge on it makes it a female. So, so a lot of times the female and male are, are different in patterning. So you got to kind of learn that too. But Cliff Smith took this photo, got one down on a flower on an aster. And, and I've, I've, I've only seen them at treetop level. So, so this is quite, quite a deal to get them that close. Next. Okay, and here you have the cabbage white with, with the most common sulfur butterfly, which are the yellow butterflies that you'll find around this area. And, and this is the orange sulfur. And you, if you get out east to the alfalfa fields, you'll see thousands of these flying around the alfalfa. And, and they're oftentimes called alfalfa butterflies. Go to the next one. These next few are all just different views. This is, this is the female of the orange sulfur. And, and you can tell that by the a double row of, of black that you can see through the wing. So you can see a male-female difference. Next. OK, this is, this is the, the Queen Alexandra sulfur. So you see that bottom wing is completely different. It's just got a little bit of a white spot and kind of a greenish cast to it. And I see this not too often, but it's, it's pretty, pretty common out in the foothills and around here. Next. Okay, this is another sulfur that you, you find dangling upside down a lot, and it's called the sleepy orange. And it's, it's got that kind of bark-like bark lower wing. And uh, that, that, that's real distinct on it, that and its droopiness. And, and when it's open, it's got a little bit of an orange cast to it. Okay, next. Now we're going to get into a, a different category. These are the hair streaks. And this is, is probably a gray hair streak. They're kind of variable. But the thing about the hair streaks is if you look at their lower wing, they've got an eye spot and an antenna. So they've got a fake head on, on their wings. And that's, that's basically designed to have birds go after that fake head rather than the real head so that they can survive. And the gray hair streak, we'll go to the next one, is, is the most common uh, hair streak around. I find it in my garden quite often. When they're flying, you'll see a blue cast to them, but when they're open, they, they, they're definitely gray when, the, when their wings are open. We'll go to that next one. Now that's another view of the gray hair streak. And, uh, so I'm going to change up the photos now because we have a different series going. 
Okay, we're going to have a little intermission here. And uh, and the thing about uh, migrant butterflies, the, you know, like I say, the range maps tell you where the butterflies are, but the tropical migrants, they'll come, we'll get some butterflies up from Mexico at certain times of the year. And especially the sulfurs I've seen in my yard, I've had uh, giant orange sulfurs and they're, they're bigger than a silver dollar. So if you see a large yellow butterfly, it's probably one of those tropical migrants. And I've usually found those in the fall. And uh, this is the checkered white. This is the female, very bright. And this is another view of the checkered white. And there's the pine white. And these are, these are orange sulfurs, a lot, lot of different brightness to them. And there's that female orange sulfur. And there's the Queen Alexandra sulfur, and there's the sleepy orange. There's another view of the sleepy orange, and there's the sleepy orange with its wings open a little bit. Doesn't look too orange, but that's what it is. So. That's on a milkweed. Now this, that, this sulfur, this is less than dime size. So if you see a tiny little sulfur when you're walking around, particularly in later in the summer, this is the dainty sulfur, and it's the smallest of the sulfurs around here. So. There's that hair streak. The gray hair streak. There's another spectacular. There's the gray hair streak on clover. The other one was on a native plant. So <clears throat> they do nectar on diff on all different plants. All butterflies will nectar on different plants, but the host plant is where they plant. They they lay their eggs so that the caterpillar can eat the plant. And that's that's the gray hair streak open. And now here's the Colorado hair streak. And look at how spectacular that fake head is on that guy. And when we get to the next one, you'll see you see them opening up and you can see how spectacular the Colorado hair streak is and, and why they named them named that or made that the state insect. It's it's a Steve Carey, the guy who's taught me most about butterflies in New Mexico, he calls this the holy grail of butterflies. But these are very common up in the Pueblo Mountain Park. Their host plant is Gamble's Oak. So if you go up to Pueblo Mountain Park, this is where you'll find this spectacular butterfly. And there he is fully opened, he or she. They both look alike, so. Yeah. Now we're into another hair streak. This is, this is a dime-sized small hair streak. The Colorado hair streak is more quarter-sized, maybe up to 50 cents. But this is the juniper hair streak, and he's on a milkweed nectaring. But out at Pueblo Reservoir and the junipers, you'll find this guy around there. Probably, you know, that's, that's the juniper is their host plant. And they've got the little fake eye and the little fake antenna. So, but they've got that greenish cast to them. And that's the only butterfly, little small butterfly around here that has that. Okay. There's another view of the juniper hair streak showing his, his fake antenna. And milkweed, if you can plant milkweed, it's good for a lot of things. It's the host plant for monarchs, but nectaring, all butterflies want it. This is one up at Pueblo Mountain Park. It's another small dime-sized hair streak. It's called the pine elf, and it doesn't have much of an antenna, but, but uh, it's, it's just a small little brownish butterfly. I've only seen one, but they're around. So, okay. Now we're going to get into the blues. And this is one I've misidentified before, because it's it's also got a fake antenna. This is the this is the western uh, tailed blue. We go to the next slide, and and there's there's the tailed blue open. And and the thing about the blues, and you, this is the only one in the west with with that tail on it. But all the blues when they're open, they look like pretty much blue. So you really want to catch them when they're when they have their wings closed. And this is on a mud puddle. That's a good place to find the blues. We'll go to the next one. This, this one is a blue that folded up. You'll see that beautiful pattern to it. And that's the marine blue. It's got a fake eye down in the bottom. It doesn't have the antenna. But this is the only blue that has that beautiful patterning on it when its wings are closed up. Go to the next one. There's another one of the marine blue closed up. Go next. And here's, here's a female marine blue open up. There's not much blue to the inside, but, but it's got that blue cast to the thorax and abdomen. But 
I mean, look at those fake eyes. So they're, they're developed for that, to fake out the birds. So, okay, next. Okay, and this, this, this one is, is probably the size of a housefly. This is the smallest butterfly in North America. It's the Western Pygmy Blue. When it opens, it's kind of brown, but it's in the blue family. But it's got that real distinct patterning, and it's very small. It's, it's nectaring on a rabbit brush, but I find them in a lot of waste areas around Pueblo, especially in the late summer and fall. That's when you find them. And that, that's the thing about butterflies. Some are spectacular and big, but some are very, very tiny. Okay, next. This one has a fake eye spot, and you see the four dots up, up on the top wing. That, that's identified as the Rhea Kurtz blue. It's the only one that has that pattern in. And it's, it's probably, it's the next smallest one, and that's another view of the Rhea Kurtz blue. And, and it's probably the second most, or yeah, it's one of the most common around. Like we, when we do butterfly counts, we find quite a few of those butterflies. Okay, next. And that, that's the Rhea Kurtz blue opened up. It's got the blue cast to it. Next. Got those eye spots. Now this, this is the spring azure complex. So there's a lot of blues that have this variable patterning. Like I said, it's, it's a complex. So they have a different kind of patterning. It's kind of, kind of light patterning, but you'll see these mostly in the spring, the spring azure complex. So that's, that's outside a mud puddle. And those are, those are also spring azures right there. A little bit different patterning. It's kind of variable. See that little seed pod? I think it's from a cottonwood. So they're, they're tiny, tiny blues, but not as small as, as the pygmy blue. Next. Okay, now it gets, this is when it gets easier because you see that orange spots on the bottom wing. And, there, and there's only one in our range map that has those orange spots on the bottom wing, and that's the Ackman blue. So, so when you see that, you'll know right away that that's what that is. But, but uh, like I say, you have to see it closed up to, to get that orange cast, usually. Although some have it on the, on the inside. We'll go to the next one and look. Yeah, there, there's a, a female um, Ackman blue, and it's got that bottom orange just like that. So, And here's the male. He's, he's more blue. I, you know, I, sometimes the females are more spectacular than the males in the butterfly world. I'm not sure why. Usually in the bird world, it's the females that are drab because they sit on the nest. Okay, next one. This one's called the Bois Duval Blue. It's got those dots up front, just on top wing, just like the Rickert's Blue, but it's got a different bottom wing pattern altogether. It doesn't have that eye spot. That's another pretty common one around here. Next. There's another view of the Bois Duval blue. Next. There's another view with a B on the same thing, so you can get a little size comparison. It's a small native B. Next. And there, there it is opening up, and you can see the nice, beautiful blue on it. Okay, next. And I think that's one, two. Yeah. And that's another view of the... the Okay, now this one's the only one around that has the orange on the bottom wing and the top wing. So that makes it easy to identify. That's the Melissa blue. Next. And here, here's another view of the Melissa blue. You see the orange on the bottom wing and orange on the top wing. And yeah, it's the only one around that has that. So that, there's another view of them, a couple of them, and they're, they're on some kind of uh, elk dung or something. So. They're, they're getting minerals out of that, so. And there's another view of the Melissa blue. You see the beautiful blue on the inner wing. Okay. Okay, now we're getting into another category, and this is one of the tropical migrants. These are the fritillaries, and they're large, you know, probably 50 cent to sometimes dollar bill sized orange butterflies. And, and they're usually, they usually fly through. You can't get them to land and get photos. And th this, one, this one is a tropical migrant. It's, it's the uh, Gulf fritillary. So it's mostly down in the Gulf. And Cliff got this photo in Pueblo. And then the next one shows, shows it. They've got these nice spots. But when it's open, it's got pretty long wings. 
And I, I was lucky enough to see one in City Park last fall. So, so they do come around, and, and they're, but they're not, not generally here to, with host plants, but they do migrate up here quite often. Next. <clears throat> and this is a fritillary that's probably the most common out on our, our plains and maybe in our gardens. It's the variegated fritillary. And it's got this kind of light band through the, the middle of it. And that makes it easy to identify because some of these fritillaries are quite difficult to tell apart. But this one, this one's pretty easy when, when you get used to looking at them, looking at them. Next one. And there's another good view of the variegated fritillary and you can see that light band through it. Next. Okay. And this, these, these are other fritillaries from the mountains. And you can see those beautiful silver white spots underneath and, and uh, when they open up on the next slide, which this one is an Edwards fritillary that's not, I haven't seen a lot of these, but, but they are spectacular in their orange. And, and you got to, I know sometimes on telling difference in subspecies of fritillaries, Steve Carey's taught me that you got to look at the color of their eyes. So you got to get a good look at some of them. But this one has a distinct pattern that makes it an Edwards fritillary. We'll go to the next one. And this, this is the Raton Mesa fritillary that's a subspecies of the Aphrodite fritillary that uh, it has either, it has, one of them has blue eyes and one has brown eyes. So, so it has a little darker cast to it. So you find this quite often down at that butterfly count at Sugar Wright State Park in New Mexico. Next. And there's, there's the view of the, the male or the, uh, the Aphrodite fritillary with its wings wide open. And you'll see the smaller butterfly next to it Below it is, is in, we're into the crescent family now. And those are smaller orange butterflies. And this, this is the northern crescent pattern on it. So you can see they're quite smaller than the fritillaries. Next. And this, this one is a field crescent. And this is, this is very common around Pueblo. And you can see it's, it's nectaring or just got off nectaring on, uh, on rabbit brush. But you can see the little bees in that photograph. This is probably one of Pearl's. Sandstrom Smith's spectacular photos. And both Cliff and Pearl do spectacular photography. And I drag them on all my butterfly counts because they can take pictures of these butterflies. Next. And that's a crescent folded up. Um, I think it's a field crescent. <laughs> but it's, it's also nectaring on that rabbit brush. And here's another view of a northern crescent. Next. Okay, and this, this one is a painted crescent, which is also common around here, but you can see by the size of the aster, it's a pretty small butterfly. And, and they can get confusing, especially when they've been chewed on or, or been through a lot of windstorms. And this is a butterfly towards the end of its life. It's another, another field crescent or painted crescent. Next one. But here's one that's, that's fresh and new, so so he's just, just been out of the caterpillar phase. Next. And here's, here's a painted crescent folded up. Next. And there, there's one unfolding. Next. And there's, there's a beautiful field crescent right there. You know, a real fresh one. And there's, there's another view of a painted crescent with all that white. Okay, this is the only photograph I've taken. And this one was, was out at the back of the gallery in the fall. And it's a Gorgon checker spot, which the checker spots are related to the crescents and can be just as confusing. But since, since I was able to hold it in my hand, I was able to identify it. But it's the only one I've seen. But I guess they're pretty common around here, too, the Gorgon checker spot. Now we're getting into the punctuation mark butterflies. They're quite large. They're, they're silver dollar size to... to half dollar size butterflies, but you can see on the lower wing, there's a white mark and that, that, that identifies it as a comma. And there's another one around here that's, that's a regular in my yard that has that white slash, but it has a dot next to it. And that's called the question mark. So these are the, these are the punctuation mark butterflies, I call them. And uh, this, this one is the, uh, the Seder, um, Butterflies. So, so we'll go to the next one. <clears throat> There's one opening its wings. So they're, they're real spectacular and they've got that real rugged 
edge to them. So, so that was the Seder comma, and this one is called the Hori comma. You can still see the comma mark, but it closed up. It's got a different pattern. It really looks like bark. Go to the next one. And there, there he is opening up. Real spectacular. And that, there he is closed up again with that real barky pattern, but the, the distinct comma showing on that. Now this one's similar, but he doesn't have the punctuation mark. He looks like bark. He's a relative of the, the commas, but when he opens up, you can't mistake him for anything else. So we'll look at him on the next slide. This is the Milbert's tortoise shell. And, and it is a spectacular butterfly, and it's it's very very common around here. But, it, but I've I've seen them even in February, so they do winter over. They'll, they'll winter over in bark and, and wood. So, next one. And this this is another one related. This is the morning cloak, and it's probably the most common butterfly of these larger ones. Its host plant is willow, but you find it a lot of in a lot of gardens and around here with that beautiful blue spotting and the, and the yellow edging. Next one. That's another view of the morning cloak with showing more of the yellow edging. But it's, it's a really neat butterfly. Now we're getting in the, the, uh, the naval butterflies. This, this is the red admiral. And, and it's, it's, you know, we're all getting, these go through relationships. So it's related to these, those punctuation butterflies. But, but, uh, but, but yeah, this is, this is the admiral. And I found this commonly in my garden. There's another good view of the red admiral. And it's the only one that's got those white spots and that beautiful orange fringe on it. Next. And this one you find up in the foothills and mountains. This is the Wiedemeyer's admiral. And it's, it's black and white. You can't mistake it for anything else. And when you see it folded up in good light as the next slide, it's, it's kind of got spectacular patterning. But that, that's the Wiedemeyer's admiral. And it, it's a common one in the mountains. Now we're getting into the ladies. And this is a this is probably, one year we had a spectacular migration of these. They were in everybody's yard, and there were thousands of them around Pueblo. And this one's at the end of its life. It's had, it had a beat up year. But this is the painted lady. And, and here's here's a fresh painted lady. And and pay attention to the white spots on the, on the fringe of the upper wing, because we'll, we'll talk about that later. But now we'll go to the next slide. The way to identify a painted lady on to any others is when its wings are folded up, it has those four distinct eye spots. And, and uh, so, so sometimes you have to wait till they fold up to tell what it is. And we'll look at the next one. See, this one has two large eye spots. And, and it's very similar when its wings are open, but this is the American lady. And it's the only one with those two large eye spots. There's another view of the American lady. Go next. That's another view of the American lady. Next. Okay, this one with its wings open, and it doesn't have, it has the, the small orange spots, but that large spot is white in the other ones. I mean, small white spots, that, that spot, there's one spot that's orange and it's white in the other ones. And this is the only one with that. This is the West Coast lady, and I find this mostly around Pueblo in the fall and, and late summer. Next. Okay, now we're back. We're, we're back to our American snout, and it's similar to those other butterflies with the white spots and everything. But it's got that nose. So, next. Now we've got one with with spectacular eye spots and those orange things. This is this is the common buckeye. I'm assuming its host plant is buckeye, but I find these, and they're they're a spectacular butterfly. I find these in late summer around here, but they could be here earlier in the year too, but mostly I find a lot of them in the late summer. But they've got those spectacular eye spots. Next. <clears throat> That's, oh, okay, now we're going back to the Admiralty. This this is a Viceroy. It's kind of related to those those Admirals, but this is the one that that is is the, the fake monarch. And and the way you tell it's it's not a monarch, it's got that that black row through its lower wings, in the middle of the lower wings. And the, the monarch butterfly does not have that. So this, this eats some plants that, uh, post on some plants that 
birds birds would find palatable so they'd like to eat this butterfly but since it looks like a monarch that's fed on milkweed they avoid this this butterfly I find this most all summer around Pueblo, the Viceroy. Now, now we're, there's another Viceroy. You can see that the bottom wing has that, that extra row right through the middle. Next. Now this, this is a spectacular orange butterfly that when he's unfolded, he's all orange. And this is the goatweed leaf wing. And on the next slide, you'll see why he's called the, the goatweed leaf wing. Mostly he looks like a leaf. When he's folded up but but boy when he opens those wings he's got that spectacular orange but he can disappear quick this is another butterfly that's in its own category that's around here that's it's the emperor the hackberry emperor and so this host plant is hackberry now we're into the the monarchs and uh, we'll, we'll go looking at these here's the monarch and see it doesn't have that that lower wing row of black so so uh this, this is the one that the birds definitely want to avoid. And, and it's the one your milkweed will, will be the host plant for it. There's another good view of the monarch. And these come through a lot in the fall. They migrate through in the spring and they come back in their one big migration in the fall. So you find them on, on the rabbit brush in, in September, a lot of them around here. Okay, and this, this is closely related to the monarch, but he doesn't have all the veining and, and uh, this is the queen. And uh, so we're into the royalty butterflies, but the queen is pretty spectacular, but you can see that not quite, quite as much veining on, it, on its wings as the monarch, but it also is a milkweed butterfly and, and the birds will avoid it. There's another good view of the queen with its wings folded up. Now we're into the, the, the uh, wood nymphs, and this is the common wood nymph. And it's basically a, a very brown butterfly with a, with a beautiful fake eye and its upper wing. And we'll go to the next one. And this, this is one that's not on the Pueblo County list, but we find it quite commonly up in Pueblo Mountain Park. It's the Meads Wood Nymph. And you'll see it's brown like the other one, not quite as dull brown, but it has that just hint of orange in its upper wing. And it's the only one like that near its eye spot. And we'll look at the next slide. And, there, there's a beautiful one on, on, on a... Now, here's, here's where we find them a lot, and here's what they probably imitate. They're in the Ponderosa Pine Forest, and, and boy, they can sure look like that bark with that, that brown and orange coloration. Okay. There, there's another one showing that camouflage they have and the fake eye, so... That's the Meads wood nymph. This one's similar. It's got that eye spot in the orange. It's a smaller butterfly and it's got a real weak flight. So when you see them fly, flutter through, um, you'll, you'll know it's not, not a ringlet. I mean, not a, not a wood nymph, but, but that, that one is, is the uh, common ringlet. And this one's related to, this is, this is the, the uh, common alpine. It's also related to those uh, wood nymphs. And, but you have to get up higher in altitude to find this one. But it is in Pueblo County. Next. Okay, now we're in a category, the, uh, the skippers. And this is a large butterfly, at least, uh, oh, probably with a wingspan of a silver dollar, but it's, it's the silver spotted skipper. And I, I like it because it's one of the skippers that I can easily identify. Some of the skippers get quite complicated in trying to tell them apart but it's very common around here. Next one. There's another view of the silver spotted skipper. Okay. Now this, this one is the uh, common sooty wing and basically it's got those white spots near it. It's a very small butterfly and sooty wing kind of, kind of describes it because it's just kind of, kind of dull otherwise. And this next one's related to it and, and uh, well, that's the sooty wing also. On a different, this, this one's related. This is the Rocky Mountain dusky wing, but uh, and these can be variable. This one's pretty spectacular in its pattern, patterning, but they can look as dull as those those uh, sooty wings too. But this is a very nice, fresh, good photo of the Rocky Mountain dusky wing. Next one. And there's another spectacular photo of the Rocky Mountain dusky wing. 
Now, this is this is one of the, the most common skippers around here. Their host plant is mallow, and you find it in waste areas and gardens all around here. And it's the checkered skipper, and it can be quite variable. We'll look at the next slide of the checkered skipper. It's pretty distinct, but you can see its body has a blue cast to it. So sometimes when it flies through your yard, you'll think you're looking at a blue. But when it lands, you'll see that distinct black and white checkered pattern. Next. There's, a, there's another view of the checkered skipper. And there's, there's the checkered skipper on, on its host plant. That's a scarlet gold mallow. So if you plant the mallows, you'll get these guys. There he is nectaring on clover, though. Okay. Now this is a skipper. Uh, at least I can identify it. It's called the Dun skipper. It's a D-U-N. It's, it's pretty dull. And I find it, it's very common up in uh, Pueblo Mountain Park, but it, but it's pretty, you know, other than describe it, it's, it's a dull looking skipper with hardly any patterning. Next. And that's, that's another view of it kind of, it's kind of a little orange cast to it, but not much marking to it. And there's another view of it. But you kind of got to study your field guides to learn the differences. This, this is one that's common around here. Another one of the orange skippers, it's called the Taxili skipper. And it's probably the most common one around here. And I haven't got good enough to identify some of the others or got close enough, but I'm, I'm working on working on, on this, learning the skippers. So. And this, this is another view of the taxili skipper from the top. And the skippers kind of fold their wings back differently than the other butterflies. This is, this is fully folded, folded back. Not, they don't close up like the, most of the other butterflies. Next. And there, there's another view of it on, on a lichen. Okay, and this is the this Colorado State butterfly state insect. This is the Colorado hair streak, and and this this is the end of our review for tonight. But I like to close out with that that beautiful butterfly. So so thanks for watching. That's the end. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think that that went through pretty well. Those are beautiful butterflies, Mark. Um, yeah, the, the photographs, Pearl and Cliff, they're, they're great photographers, and they take all kinds of photos when you, when you have them. And I, when we do the butterfly counts, I, I love to have them along with their, their cameras. The other thing you need along, close focus binoculars help too. And you can get binoculars that can focus close, as close as four feet. I've got some that focus to seven feet, and I've got some, some real expensive binoculars that only focus to 12 feet, so they're no good for butterflies. Mm -hmm. They're good for distant birds, but not butterflies. So I have a few questions here. Sure. Um, someone's asking, what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Okay, generally, butterflies have knobs on the end of their antenna, where, where uh, moths have that feathery antenna, and generally, Moths fly at night and butterflies fly at day, but there are exceptions to all of that. And, and uh, you know, moths are something else to get into all together. There, there, there are probably moths that are in Pueblo that haven't been identified to science and micro moths and stuff. So if you want to really get into something interesting, get into moth identification. There are no real good field guides to moths because there are just so many more moths compared to butterflies. But, but those are, those are generally the two rules that, that separate them. And the uh, second question is, are there uh, more butterfly watching groups going on right now? I, I think people are getting more and more interested in butterflies. So, so yeah, there are. And, and I really recommend going down. If you have a chance to go to Sugar Rite State Park, it's just a two and hour and 15 minute drive from Pueblo. You go through Trinidad and Raton to get there. But uh, Steve Carey is, is great on teaching butterflies. And he's there on the Saturday. And if you want the more inept butterfly, you go there on Sunday, and I'll, I'll lead your trips then. So. But, but that's on June 6th, 18th and 19th. I'll be there the 19th. Okay. Uh, Mark, what's the lifespan of a butterfly? Well, generally it's, it's pretty short, you know, like the monarch migration, they have three different migrations and life cycles migrating north, and then they'll have one life cycle migrating south. <clears throat> but like I say, some of the butterflies winter over, so they will, will go a whole year, but, but usually not that long. 
you know, the, the caterpillar probably has the lifespan, but once they're a butterfly, they don't live that long. Their purpose is to lay eggs on the right host plant, wherever they are. So it's a short lifespan. And uh, do, do butterflies like all species of milkweed or, or specific ones? Well, I think I the monarchs, monarchs like all species, but the thing about milkweed is they have the, those different flowers and those, you know, all butterflies will nectar at the flowers. Mm -hmm. So any native plant, but it, but all, yeah, they'll, the, the monarchs and queens, they'll, they'll take any milkweed as a host plant if they find it. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh my yeah. gosh. I, uh, I was just watching in awe, beautiful butterflies. And I, my most common memories of butterflies growing up and, and chasing after butterflies and being interested in them are mostly with monarchs. Those are okay. very common for me. Um, growing up on the East Coast, we had some of the same. And yeah. um, uh, yellow swallowtails, black swallowtails, monarchs, um, the occasional. And that's um, one of the one of the questions was I think young young children sometimes um, confuse perhaps the larger moths like a lunar moth or um, like the, the giant owl moths, yeah. um, with butterflies sometimes because of the size, but, um, that's well, there are some spectacular moths Yeah, and there are a lot of really dull Completely. ones too. And yeah. I just touched on a few of the butterflies around here. You know, you get in that field guide and you'll, and you'll start finding a lot of, a lot of different butterflies than what I showed tonight. So, so can, it's, can it's something those, to get into. Say those field guides again. Uh, okay. Mark. My favorite is the Kaufman field guide. Kaufman, yeah. and this has has all the butterflies of North America, and then the, this one, the butterflies through binoculars. Steve Carey does some of the photographs and is a contributor to this, but but like I say, this is just the butterflies of the West. But it's also a good one, but it doesn't fit in my pocket as well as the the Kaufman. The Kaufman. But I, I use this one more in in the car or as a reference. But the Kaufman, this will fit in my back pocket. So mm -hmm. I use this on all the butterfly trips. So. Butterflies of North America. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Mario. Yes. Thank you. I just added both of those field guys to the Facebook, to uh, the, the feed on Facebook for people okay. so they can refer to them later. Um, and I just want to thank you so much again. I have just gotten a major education and I appreciate it so much. And so would you say that right now is – is a particular height of butterfly watching right now in public? Um, yeah. Well, the other thing about butterflies too is, is there are different seasons for some of them. So, so uh, like if you go out today, butterflying, you're not going to see what you might see in late summer. Mm -hmm. So, so we have, uh, when we've done butterfly counts up in Pueblo Mountain Park, we vary it by different times of the summer and we'll get different butterflies at those different times. But, but I think, you know, the native plant movement is helping a lot of butterflies and I really highly recommend planting native plants in your garden. That's the best thing you can do for butterflies. Birds too, huh? Yeah, birds too. You well, bet. birds like to eat the butterflies too. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> and the other thing about butterflies, they don't like cold and rain. You won't find them. They need the hot, sunny time. And that reminds me of one count we had up at Pueblo Mountain Park. It was it was a rainy, misty day, and we saw no butterflies until mid-morning. And finally, a butterfly flew, flew across the road, and a, a bird came out and ate it. Oh, so, oh no. <laughs> but, but, yeah, so, so, you know, birds tend to, tend to go in undercover when it gets hot in the day, and that's when the butterflies come the out. Butterflies so, are out. Go birding in the early morning, but but don't we don't start our counts until at least nine a.m. on these butterfly counts. Is that what it'll be when in your July count? It'll start at nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Mark. I have one last question before we uh, close out our program. What has been the most spectacular butterfly that you have been able to witness in your lifetime? Well, I'm kind of yeah. That's a loaded question. I'm kind of partial to that common buckeye because with those giant eye spots and the orange. So, uh, so that's one of them. And I, I kind of, you know, I haven't painted the, uh, 
Gulf Friddle area yet, but but that was a spectacular view and un, unexpected. So I'll probably do a painting of that bird, that butterfly too. But I haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Again, thank you both so much. Thank you so much, Mark, for bringing your your vast knowledge of butterflies here with us tonight. And thank you again, Peg, for joining us um, on behalf of uh, the Arkansas Valley uh, Audubon Society. And uh, thank you again, viewers. We had a wonderful audience tonight. And I thank you for joining us. And uh, please join us again for an, another program uh, with the AVAS. And uh, thank you for joining us from the library. Have a good evening. Thank you, Bree. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.